Hello, my friends, and welcome to the 52nd episode of Patterson in Pursuit. This episode is coming to you from Brisbane, Australia, and we're talking about the philosophy of mathematics. Supposedly, there are multiple sizes of infinity. In fact, there's an infinite number of different sizes of infinity. How can we make sense of this? How can we make sense of one size of infinity? To help me answer, I'm talking with Dr. Toby Meadows of the University of Queensland, who is a philosopher that works in the philosophy of mathematics, and he specializes in questions about set theory. We had a fantastic conversation on the topic as I'm trying to piece together and make sense of the orthodox mathematical claim that there are multiple sizes of infinity. I have a difficult enough time wrapping my head around one size of infinity. The sponsor for this episode is the company Praxis. If you think this show is neat, the idea of somebody outside the academic system going around and talking about big ideas and making a career as an independent intellectual outside the system, well, thank you. But this is just the beginning. I'm at the front line of a new generation of professionals. The new generation does not need to waste four years of their life and $100,000 getting certified to work and learning a bunch of theories that are all wrong about how the world works. We start creating value and learning about how the real world works today. And that's what Praxis is all about. They take people who are enthusiastic, who are competent, who want to learn, who want to accomplish, and they give them real-world job training for three months, followed by six months of a paid apprenticeship. The old established system is being phased out, and the new system is being phased in. So if you want to be a part of that, check out steve-patterson.com slash Praxis, P-R-A-X-I-S. All right, guys, so I hope you enjoy my interview with Dr. Toby Meadows talking about infinity and the philosophy of mathematics. First of all, I want to thank you for sitting down and speaking with me today. My pleasure. I've got a running theme on my show, and that is trying to understand the nature of infinity and some of the claims in modern mathematics about the completed infinity and the infinity of infinities, the different sizes of infinity. So infinity seems to be this central concept in both mathematics proper and in the philosophy of mathematics, but I've got a really difficult time wrapping my head around it. So I was hoping we could start with the basic question, maybe a basic even just terminological question. When mathematicians talk about infinity, what exactly do they mean by the term? There's an intuitive sense of infinity, which is this idea of the never-ending or never-completed or, or unbounded, something like that. Is that, a, is that the correct way of thinking about a infinity, or the term infinity? Um, well, one way of answering it is one standard sort of set theoretic definition one might give is to say, if we took the natural numbers uh, and we have a putative infinite collection, if I can make an injective map between the natural numbers and this collection, so an injection into it, so to speak, uh, then I have that, that, that other collection is infinite. And mm -hmm. by injection, I mean it's a one-to-one -one map. So it's like tying a piece of string from every natural number to, to one and only one object in the, set, on the, other, in the other set. Mm -hmm. And in that case, you have a, uh, an infinite set. Mm -hmm. But of course, this might seem a little question-begging in that I've already sort of wheeled the natural numbers in right at the beginning. Right, right. Um, so, so, so let me try yeah. to explain that. So let me try to rephrase that sure. and see if I do a correct job and then correct me if I'm wrong. So the way that mathematicians talk about whether or not, let's say, a set is infinite is they say there's this concept of one-to-one -one correspondence that imagine you had, just imagine that you had an infinite set. So you have this set of numbers. And for each element in that set, you are mapping the one element to an element of another set. So you said you tie the piece of string. Sometimes the examples used, you know, imagine there's an infinite amount of people and an infinite amount of seats. There's one person for one seat. And if there is this one-to-one -one correspondence, each element is matched up, then the mathematician concludes, okay, this additional set is also infinite. Is that correct? Uh, yes, if, if one of the comparative sets that we're comparing is, um, uh, say, the set of natural numbers, okay. which is sort of paradigmatically infinite. Okay, so how do we get to the set of natural numbers. So we're not talking about the other infinite sets. We're saying the nat natural numbers. How can we understand that as an infinite? What does that mean? This is a good question. So I'm trying to think about the right way one might answer it. I mean, in some sense, I suppose it's obviously not finite in that uh, it's, uh, there's no natural number along the, along the natural numbers such that 
you, it has the same size as the totality of the natural numbers, and it has this inductive property. I suppose that's the, probably the m most natural thing to think of. So, uh, if uh, we, well, how would we put this? So I suppose it, maybe where we get, maybe we want to be a bit more philosophical when we, we think about what the natural numbers are, and try and think of it as being a kind of a given that we accept, so that it's so if we. Uh, take one step toward the horizon, then we can take another step toward the horizon, then we can take another step toward the horizon, and then we can, if we consider that process, so to speak, coming to its metaphysical kind of limit, then that would give us a kind of a model of the natural numbers in some mm. sense. Um, as to, yeah, so I, I think, so that I'm probably just really answering there, I think, why we have the natural numbers rather than mm -hmm. answering why they're infinite. So there is another definition of infinite we could give, which is known as, um, uh, which is from Dedekind, which is if I can take a set and inject it into itself, then that set is infinite. So this is, so th what do I mean by that? So one of these one-to-one -one maps. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's first convince ourselves that it doesn't work with finite cases. So if I have five sheep, I can't make, and then consider what we call proper subsets, so subsets of that set of sheep, which are not the whole set. Um, there's no way for me to do a one-to-one -one map back into it. I, if I just tie the string, so to speak, back into the set, I'll have to eventually tie, I'll have to, for two sheep, I'll have to tie it to one sheep. So maybe if we imagine having sheep in two paddocks, we've got five sheep in one paddock, four sheep in the other. If I try and tie string from the five sheep paddock into the four sheep paddock, at least uh, in one instance, I will have to have two sheep in the five sheep paddock mm -hmm. ha um, lining up with one in the other paddock. So it's very simple to say, often easier to draw than say. Yeah. Um, so that doesn't work in the finite case, but in the infinite cases, um, th we, we do have this kind of property. So a classic example here would be, I can tie a piece of string from every natural number into, to every even number. Uh, so this is something that infinite sets have. So I can, so we'd agree that there are uh, some natural numbers are not even numbers, so that mm -hmm. we actually have a proper subset of the natural numbers here, which mm -hmm. is the evens. And I can actually make an injection, so I can tie a one to one, make this one to one map between the naturals and the even numbers. Uh, and so that that's an, another way of saying we have even numbers. So that might be a, uh, uh, using that definition, we might feel perhaps more comfort with uh, seeing that the natural numbers are infinite. Um, that, usually, sorry, yeah, that only works if if it's the case that they are infinite though. So that would be a that would be like a property or a, a counterintuitive property of an infinite set mm -hmm. is that you can take, let's say, every other element and still tie them in a one-to-one -one correspondence with every element. Mm -hmm. Right. But that still only works when you get the that infinite set in the first place. So let's so with your horizon analogy, so it's every step you take, you're not getting closer to the mm. to the horizon. If we follow that line of reasoning, intuitively, I would think, I'm, I'm down mm -hmm. with that, I think, depending on what the metaphysics of numbers are, but we, maybe we'll come back to that later. But wouldn't that mean you could never complete the infinite set? So maybe you could say mm -hmm. something like, there is not a finite amount of natural numbers, but wouldn't that necessarily mean that you couldn't have a set of them? You couldn't um, have all of them? So I see there are two things going on here. So in the first explanation, which I think is a good way of setting up what you, we think the natural numbers are, but perhaps not a gri well, not as grippy a way as describing why they're infinite. So I think that the Dedekind uh, approach to answering the question of why they're infinite, if we study the natural numbers and we talk about them, we think it does have this property that I can inject it back into itself. So we might still worry about whether there are natural numbers, but according to that definition of infinite, we do seem to have something like infinity going on there. Hmm. Um, that said, though, so if we want to open up this other side of things, so if we're, we've got, I get this sort of metaphor of you know walking out to the horizon, and I think you're right to say, you know, so there is a legitimate worry about uh, completion of of of, um, of the natural numbers, so to speak, along mm -hmm. this in this metaphor, um, and you might wonder, well, can we talk of something as being a legitimate totality if it can't be completed? Yeah, um, I think. You know the standard sort of you know very sort of philosoph philosophers typical answer to this is it depends what you mean by completed. <laughs> so in one very obvious sense, yes, not even in principle can a uh, you know like some ideal agent or you know machine you know get to the horizon and, and complete that process. That's right. not what's going to go on. Right. Um, 
but maybe that's not what we need. It's not the notion of completion that we need to be able to talk about collections, for example. Okay. And maybe that's what we want with uh, a theory of sets. So we want to be able to say, uh, well, you know, we've been talking a lot so far about these things called the natural numbers and you know, this, this collection of things. And what is it that makes it that we can talk about them? We can kind of give definitions of them in some mm. sense. So I gave a kind of metaphoric definition. We could, give, we could get more technical and give a kind of an axiomatic kind of definition. But there does seem to be some sense in which we can pin down modulo some metaphysics worries, at least up to isomorphism anyway, what we mean by the natural numbers. And so that seems to mean we're talking about an infinite collection. We've described it in some kind of fashion. So maybe being able to describe it mm. is, is, is the right kind of notion of completion to get this sort of thing moving. Uh, it is a weakening, though, of completion. So we should be careful with that. When you say it's an infinite collection... For me, I would say it depends on what you mean by collection. Mm -hmm. Because if we say something like there is not a finite amount of natural numbers, then it seems to me that you can't actually be talking about... Well, I guess I would say this. Any collection that you're talking about has to be a finite collection given what we mean by collection. So if I say there's a, there is a never-ending amount or a never a never completed amount or a never totally you cannot totally encapsulate all of them then mm -hmm. it would seem like we can't really talk about the natural numbers in the collection sense maybe we could talk about them as like a we could say there are these objects that have properties and we could talk about like the type of properties that the object has and we could say so you know the all the natural numbers have these particular property, but we're not talking about all as a collection or all as some quantitative amount. It's more like a property description of the thing, if that makes any sense. Yeah, so you, one could be perhaps resistant to... So there is a move that I'm making here. So I'm kind of reifying the, the natural numbers when I talk in this kind of way. I'm saying I'm comfortable enough talking about the natural numbers and, and the even numbers, all of these mm -hmm. cl classes of them, that in some sense I have... If we look just grammatically at how I'm speaking, I've kind of I'm talking about them like they're objects of yeah. some kind. Yeah. Um, whereas I feel like maybe you've got a, a kind of what we might think of as a, a metaphysically heavier or thicker notion of collection, mm. and I, my, I think mine's quite light. I just really want to track our theoretical ways of speaking about these things and just be faithful to it being an object in the sense that because I'm a logician, so you know, I'm quantifying over these things. What are the rules of this kind of game? Um, you know, that's the, the really sort mm -hmm. of uh, weak way of talking about mm. it. But yeah, what's the, what are the rules of talking about infinite collections? And we do do mm. it. So how does how does this all come together? We might still want to drive a kind of, if we're being you know put out you know, metaphysics hats on. We might still want to drive a, a wedge between a, a, a thicker, more substantive notion of collection that involves some sort of very satisfying notion of completion like you know i counted them all i've got them here they're in this bucket you know <laughs> yeah, yeah as opposed to well i can merely describe the properties that these things have in and so you know maybe i've got a criterion where, where i could uh if you offer me one of these objects i could tell you if it is in the set or not that kind of thing yeah that that might be a so, so that you know then we might move to something a little weaker so we could take us we could take some gentle steps toward the infinite like so from <laughs> Having full completion, we could think about well, what the even numbers. They're not that weird, so I can talk about kind of rule for for capturing all. If I if I start with zero and then I add mm. two and then I add two again and I add two again, if I eventually get to that number with mm. this sum up putative number with that process, I can tell you it's it's in there. And if I get past it and it wasn't in, it's not. So that's a kind of we might sort of th start thinking about different rules for uh, as a way of talking about infinite collections, you know, for rules for creating them. This is, this is still quite weak in comparison to set theory. Um, so let's talk about a little bit about that notion of uh, the metaphysical weakness versus something with a little more... I like that. I think the term you used was grippy. I like that. I'm going to start using that. <laughs> um, if I were to ask a standard mathematician or logician what they are talking about when they're talking about a collection, what is the answer is there something is it an actual something is a collection a, a concrete something or is it a way of talking more i think 
there's a lot of variation in the mathematics community about this kind of thing. This is so, and look, I've never done any uh, like studies of, of this. I think this would be an interesting area to, for people to, to move into. So my evidence is purely is you know it's quite anecdotal. I do talk to colleagues about this a bit. Um, I mean, this is, what's the, the, the famous quote is that you know, so mathematicians are from Monday to, to Friday are formless, and then on right. Saturday and Sunday they can pull out their happy Platonism and really believe in the natural numbers. Right. And I think this does speak of, well, music does speak of a certain kind of variation. If you're trying to be careful, yeah. So you know, so and when are people careful? Usually when philosophers talk to them. <laughs> so when you know, because philosophers like to ask these sort of thorny questions, and, and understandably, mathematicians feel like that might be the, the philosopher in question might be trying to corner them into a, mm-hmm. a view that they don't like. Mm-hmm. If you take a kind of formalist sort of view where you th- think of it as, well, it's just a way of talking that happens to help me solve these sorts of problems. It's, there's kind of, it's, in some sense, you could almost think of it as a sort of game that we play. Mm-hmm. But there are pragmatic implications of it. It's not completely, you know, we do deserve research money, you know, but, uh, but it is, um, you know, it, but we don't have to take it all too seriously. So that's a, and if you talk like that, I think it's, you, you, you're often quite safe from a lot of problems. Mm-hmm. But, but I think a lot of mathematicians have some quite deep commitments to the, mm-hmm. to the existence of natural numbers and to particular sets. And what do they mean when they mean an infinite collection? Uh, I mean, I think they probably would tend to give you the kind of definition. I mean, you know, something like Dedekind's or a set theoretic definition like I gave first. Mm-hmm. Set theorists, again, have a wide diversity of views about these sorts of things. So I, I suspect... If you're looking for the intersection of these views, it, it probably gets relatively close to what the axioms and the, and the textbooks kind of say. And if the, when people stray further away from that, things get a little bit more uh, out of hand. So would you say it's fair to, to just make a statement about the discipline, not in a, necessarily a positive or a negative way, just depending on your perspective, that there is no at least explicit metaphysical claim about the objects in mathematics, that they are existent things that exist in some other universe, or if maybe the objects in math are just ways of talking to solve problems, would you say that the, the, the standard, uh, if you can put that in quotes, the, the standard response is, well, it's, we don't really make a claim either way? Yeah, I think, uh, yes. No, I think in general that would be the standard response. So one has to be careful. So it means we mean standard, yeah, the, okay. the safe kind of response. But, um, but yeah, if you're talking to a mathematician on the pub, at the okay. pub on Friday night, right. they might, ha- you know, they might wax a little bit more rhetorical. Of okay. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I think that is the standard response. I think that's um, uh, a good kind of answer because it is kind of safe and it does talk about, you know, it, it sort of just leans back into a kind of common framework. But I mean, I think to get any further than this, you do need to take kind of philosophical sorts of moves. So. Mm. Um, I mean, a classic kind of approach to uh, what, the, the ontology of, say, um, so I'm, I, I work mostly in set theory, so the ontology of set theory would be loosely sort of Quinean. And so Quine has this famous slogan, to be is to be the value of a bound variable, But to put, which is pithy, but the idea of it is that if I hold a particular theory, really th- there's nothing more to what exists according to the theory than what the theory tells me exists. We don't have to worry about whether numbers are like tables and chairs or things like that. Really, this is just a, a manifestation um, or a corollary, so to speak, of, of, what my, of what my theoretical commitments give. But that's only one view. There are, you know, there are other more robust sort of Platonistic kind of views out there, more constructivist views. But it, provided if, we're all, if we were all working in the same theory, then a lot of these sort of meta-ontological concerns really won't affect the actual mathematical practice. And that's perhaps mm. the big, big reason why mathematicians don't need to answer this question in some sense. It just won't really change things. So if I were to say that from a metaphysical standpoint, from a philosophic standpoint, the concept of an infinite set is something that has no metaphysical corollary because there's some, what we mean by a collection or what we mean by a set is something which is necessarily, let's say, bounded or finite or concrete or actual. Now, if that's the position, if that's the claim, wouldn't that have implications on the mathematics, though, if it's true that you can't actually use that concept, or if it's true that the concept of an infinite set is well, I mean, incorrect? Here we're getting into some of the deeper, darker kind of metaphysics sort of stuff, I suppose, because I feel like just because you can't find a... It, the principle that you're relying on here sounds like if you can't find some sort of metaphysical counterpart to my theoretical... Um, paraphernalia so you know uh, this, this theory says there are natural numbers but there aren't any of those or there aren't sets of natural numbers mm. around my theory doesn't 
even though my theory says it, they don't exist. If that's the case, then you can't use such a theory. Now, that, that, that seems like a bold claim. Like, uh, <laughs> Can you give an example? Outside of mathematics, would you say that there's any theoretical area of knowledge where the objects in a theory don't have to correlate to existing objects? Um, hmm. I mean, I think I have to give mathematics a little bit of slack here in okay. that, well, in, <laughs> in that m even though there's, there'll be wide divergence as to what abstract are, so what abstract objects are, most people would agree that um, mathematical objects are abstract objects. There is, of course, this group of people called the nominalists who, who don't agree with this. <laughs> Because um, you know we expect in math in philosophy of mathematics particularly uh, that we'll have a lot of diversity here. But so so even if we grant the existence mm -hmm. of abstract objects, let's say yeah, you know, I, I can at least entertain that as a as a coherent idea. Mm -hmm. But what if I were to say an infinite set even isn't even an abstract object because it implies some kind of a there's self contradictory notions about collection and completed. Even if we say numbers are abstract objects. So I mean, if, if you're going to go, if we're going to grant something like the principle that I think is underlying what you're saying, uh, and we, we really say that the infinite sets just don't, aren't even abstract objects, um, then then I think maybe one would have grounds for saying that theories that admit them are just wrong. Mm -hmm. And at this point, you're going to end up in somewhere quite difficult, like finitism or ultrafinitism, which are <laughs> um, so believing that there is a largest natural number. Um, and then you might ask the question, can we add one to it? And then so, things get difficult there. So let me try to answer that. Yeah. That is definitely my um, mm -hmm. disposition, is to be more of a, a, in the finitist camp. Mm -hmm. So for that question, I don't think it follows that there is a largest natural number for this reason. If okay. we conceive of numbers as, as concepts, as ideas in our head, then it might be the case that at any given time there is a largest number that somebody is conceiving, just like there's a largest sentence that has been written or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that you can't still create a larger number or a larger sentence. Mm -hmm. So it would seem weird to say there's a largest number, but that's without including any actual infinities, we could say there's no inherent limit to the size of number that you can conceive of. Yeah, okay, so this, is a, this reminds me of uh, some... So depending, we, so we probably don't want to think of it as a specific time or something like that. We probably want it's it's a it seems more like a modal kind of claim in the sense that it's like you're saying, well, the, perhaps there is a largest natural number, but it's always possible. Maybe we could go to another world, so to speak, because <laughs> this is the way philosophers like to talk about these sorts of things. But it's a nice framework for it. Um, so it's possible that we could. The, that there's always possible that there's a large number. Is, is, would that be an adequate way of paraphrasing I, what I you're saying? Th no, I think it would be a much more, it, just, it would strictly be saying just like at any given time, there mm -hmm. is literally a largest sentence yeah. that somebody is thinking of. There's a finite amount of words in that sentence. Yeah. That doesn't mean that you can't take that sentence and make a larger one. But sure. at any given time, it's still going to be finite. So. Okay. Yeah. So that's what I would say is the same thing with numbers. There is literally, at any given time, the largest sure. number that has, you know, Graham's number raised to a power of itself yeah, yeah, or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. And somebody else could come up with a larger one, but until they do, that number, there's no, that number has no existence. Okay. Yeah, all right. So I wouldn't... Okay, that's fine. Um, I still feel like you're, you're pushing a lot of... There's, there's, there's a lot of possibility sort of like <laughs> pushing this. Because like, so you, your whole way of saying it, it doesn't mean that someone couldn't make a larger number, I right. think. So this is, a, you can, you, what you're doing is using possibility to, to, to allow uh, this expansion of things. And this mm -hmm. is a common kind of move. So this is, so um, probably the leading proponent of this sort of view at the moment is a guy called Oystein Lenebo in, um, who's based in Norway. Um, and he does this with set theory, but a guy called, his, his supervisor, Charles Parsons, used to do this with the natural numbers, trying to develop a kind of a, a modal way of looking at infinity. Hmm. So the idea of looking at, if we could go to an add at larger number, maybe there's always a possible, so I say possible hmm. world, mainly just, I, I don't want to, I'm not super committed to what those are or anything like that, but hmm. really just this is kind of another theoretical framework. But the, one of the, inter the interesting idea here is, I think, using possibility or modality, as, as philosophers always call it, uh, to analyze or, or um, the notion of infinity. Maybe you could get rid of infinity if mm -hmm. you just use possibility. Mm -hmm. So you could look at it as a kind of a vindication, perhaps, of Aristotle's idea that, that there aren't actual infinities. Mm -hmm. um, and this, yeah, this is a very interesting line of research. And, and 
Yeah, I mean, I, I do think infinity and possibility are kind of deeply embedded. Yeah. Okay, so I, I want to re-ask the question about using concepts that maybe don't correlate to any metaphysical existent. So let's say that mathematicians get a special exception here, that they mm -hmm. get to do this. Is there any other area of thought that, that can get away with this, that we would say, hey, you can't, you can't use a concept that doesn't correlate to anything? I mean, I think this is the, the, the reason why I'm trying to wheel in the abstract as a kind of sort of a get out of jail card here. <laughs> I feel like um, if we look at other areas of theoretical research, say like uh, theoretical physics or something like that, even though mm -hmm. uh, things get very complicated there, there is still an idea that um, these are pointing to you know, cut it, carving nature, so to speak, at its joints. Yeah. Uh, and even though it's very small and very difficult to conceive, uh, there is an idea that this is this is somehow representational, mm -hmm. and I, I'm not sure that is so. Um, if the data point, well, you know, the overall data for mathematics is the same as it is in, in say, in say physics in, in that kind of way, uh, and why I say that is, I suppose, um, if we consider radically different foundational viewpoints on mathematics, that, that the, the ontology looks just so often looks so very very different. Mm. I mean, so an interesting feature is usually we end up with the natural numbers being in common. So everyone, you know, we, it takes a long way to get down to there. But even then, if you consider some of the non-classical kind of uh, paraconsistent sort of approaches, even the natural numbers can be wildly, you know, different. And, it's, you know, it's even very difficult to compare different ways of looking at, at, at foundations, you know, at what people think the landscape of mathematics is. Okay. So... Yeah, so that's so maybe that, that's just to try and answer why I think mathematics might be a little different to other areas in this sort of sense. So different theoretical frameworks can radically change the landscape in, in ways I think which are a little different. Do you think that there is a necessary reason to have that metaphysical, almost agnosticism in mathematics? Because not being a mathematician and not knowing the you know, huge amount of work that's in mathematics, it would seem like you can... You can have a, meta a mathematical framework, and you can use math and physics and everywhere that you have applied mathematics. It seems like you can have that metaphysical correlation. So when engineers use mathematics, they can use it to actually reference you know, existing things in the world and their properties. So, And even in physics, like you said, there seems to be this, this representational uh, part to mathematical physics as it's describing existing things. So if you can do that, then why would we, ha what value is there in math that is disconnected from existent phenomena? Well, I think there are, there are probably two, so if, particularly if we're thinking of infinite collections, I think there are two kind of answers one could give. So one's a kind of a practical answer. So uh, even though most of how we understand the physical world these days suggests that really it's finite collections of things bumping into each other. Mm -hmm. And so we should just be able to, you know, so to speak, model all of this with a computer because there are only finite that many points to do this. It actually turns out that in a lot of cases that uh, using the tools of analysis and calculus, which, involve, which presuppose infinite collections, actually makes things more efficient and simpler to mm. calculate. So there's a pragmatic answer one might mm. have there. A more uh, principled answer might be to suggest that, uh, how would we put it, um, we often need to make theories about infinite collections, even though, so for example, the theory of the natural numbers. So we want this, so we don't want a theory that goes up to however, you know, n, which is really, really big, and we'll probably never count that high, because we always have this, there's this in principle idea, well, there's still m plus one exists, or maybe even that it's possible. So because mm -hmm. usually actually what happens is between these uh, modal ways of doing things and the, the existential way of doing things, they actually come out being the same theory yeah. in some sense. You can intertranslate between them. Mm -hmm. So you might see this modal way as sort of being a more sort of philosophically satisfying, but ultimately they're really going to be, do the same kind of work. So what, what's in principle stopping you from considering this next possibility? So if you really want to close out all of the possibilities, then suddenly you're in this world of the infinite. And so why, how did you get there? Because in principle there was no reasonable place to stop. <laughs> And, well, if you can find it, if, yeah, I suppose the thing is if you can find an adequate answer to, as to where we should stop, then that, that, that might be a way to, to answer that question. So suppose if you may be a, um, a strong physicalist and, and a nominalist, you might just think the atoms in the universe is, is all, all there is. 
and we shouldn't talk about anything else. And maybe then you could rule out the in principle uh, solution along something along those lines. But I think the pragmatic one probably still will stay for some time. Well, this, is, this isn't my position, but um, something, a number I, I, I would think of if somebody were going to take that um, kind of physicalist approach is so you have the base unit in physical reality, which is the, the Planck unit. You have the absolute amount, a number of those in the universe. And then you could say something like a power set of all of those units. So mm -hmm. every possible combination with every other possible combination. Whatever that is, <laughs> you couldn't possibly have I suppose any, but the, yeah. that seems like a bit of a leap, doesn't it? In the power set, that there aren't that many objects in the unit, whatever. So if, if, if the plane constant is the, the smallest unit. Okay, interesting. Then you... So I, I would say you bring in set theoretic kind of content as soon as you bring this. Because what you're doing here is you're considering all the possibilities that yeah, the, yeah. To, of rearrangement. And that's a modal notion or it's, like it's one of those things that gets us, yeah, yeah. It starts us off on the, the infinite, in, kind of into the world of the infinite. I suppose maybe one, well, this is a side note, but it's actually an directly related to this. The reason I say that is I just had a conversation with a gentleman um, about consciousness. And we were talking about this kind of this idea of emergence. In this theory of, you know, the, the strict physicalism, would you say that that kind of precludes this idea of radical emergence? Because if you could have emergence in addition to the, the bits of matter, then you would still have an additional thing. Oh, this, uh, <laughs> it just popped in my head when you were saying that. I think that this is outside my area these days. I, I, okay. yeah, I, yeah, consciousness is a... Uh, yeah, I, I just have colleagues who work and who do good work, and I, I can't wait. Okay, okay, fair enough. So let's get into the standard a concept of infinities and this notion of the infinite number of infinities sometimes called the hierarchy of infinities mm -hmm. so for my audience maybe that's unfamiliar with the standard um, way that mathematicians conceive of this i'm going to try to do it justice and if i make an error um, you please correct me sure so there's this idea of countability in mathematics which says in principle you could if you had a list of infinite size, then you could list out all of the natural numbers, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. You could; Those are, in principle, listable. But there are some numbers which are, in principle, not even listable. That even if you had a list of an infinite size, those numbers could be on the list. And there's a su supposed proof of this by a guy named Georg Cantor, who came up with a clever method, which is called diagonalization, which is essentially a way to point at a number that by its nature must not be included on, a, on any list, even of infinite size. So therefore, because there are numbers which can't even be listed on your infinite list, you have to have bigger sizes of infinity. Those numbers are out there, but they're not even in the, the set of natural numbers, their base level of infinity. You have a larger size infinity. And that's where you get something like the real numbers, let's say. So is that a fair way yeah, of putting yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that is fair. Here's maybe like a like a more palpable way, perhaps, of describing... Because you, you can actually explain Candice there relatively quickly. If, do, do you mind to have a quick set? Please. Yep. Uh, so imagine you have a collection of coins. So I'm, I'm Australian, so we'll have 10 cent pieces, right? And we'll, but they'll go, we'll have infinitely many of them. We're very rich. <laughs> it's a very ideal situation. So imagine them sort of going out to the horizon and they have a particular configuration of heads and tails. Okay. So but we've got one, one of them for every natural number. So to speak, we could write a natural number on each of them in ascending order as they go out to the horizon. Now we might then consider, okay, what are all of the different possible arrangements of heads and tails that we could have of, for those, for the, this infinite sequence of coins? Mm. So imagine that. So it goes out to the horizon. Now imagine it's being at this giant table. Okay, so it's a table with all of the different arrangements. You might wonder if the, the list of different arrangements could also be labeled using the natural number. So another way of thinking of this is, suppose it were, then this table would be a giant infinite square. <laughs> so this, it's, it's an odd way, of, you know, we have to be a little careful here, but the, the approximation works well, relatively well. So then what Cantor says is, okay, well suppose you did have this giant square with all of the different arrangements on there. I can show you an arrangement that isn't in your grid. Mm. And so what he does is says, go down the diagonal of the grid. So just consider the first square in the uh, uh, yeah the first square the first in the, in the first row, and flip the coin. Then go to the next one, the, the next diagonal. So the second column in the second row, flip the coin. Second third column in the third row, flip the coin. And keep on doing this all the way down again to infinity. It takes a while to do, obviously. <laughs> so once you've done this though, you have 
by definition, a new row, if you flatten this out, so to speak, so if you flatten out that diagonal and take it up, you can see that is a configuration which can't be in any of the ones we've got because it's different by, yeah. by definition of, from each of them. So we've shown though, so what you show there is that actually if, if there were a square, there would be something that had to be left out. And so, so we, it can't be a square. So you can't represent all of the possibilities in mm. a square. So that means you can't list all of these infinite configurations of coins using the natural numbers. And so these actually are like, so what, if, we, if you turn these into ones and zeros rather than heads and tails, this is actually just a mm -hmm. representation of all the infinite binary decimal place numbers. So these are and sets the reals between zero and one. Mm -hmm. So th these are what these often called logicians reals. And yes, yeah, so we, we can't enumerate these, but these are all of the possibilities, so to speak. So, and we take that principle, and not only is there one size of infinity, two sizes of infinity, three sizes, there's an infinite number of infinities. Yeah. Which seems very hard to wrap our head around. Um, now, Cantor believed that there was such a thing as the absolute infinity, mm -hmm. the infinity which no greater could be conceived. Um, and... From my understanding, Cantor also identified that with God. He said that, yes. that absolute infinity is God. And as an interesting historical note, he also believed that the absolute infinity God spoke to him and told him about the theory of the infinity of infinities, which I think is an interesting... <laughs> it is interesting. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it happened, maybe it didn't. Um, but when we think about sizes of infinity, is it fair... Or is it correct to think of size in the way that we think about it with finite things? Is it fair to take that concept and apply it to infinite size? Or is that, is that, is that a, a mistake? So there's this concept in mathematics, cardinality, which yep. makes a great deal, crystal clear sense when I think about finite things. But then when you talk about the cardinality of infinite things, I've spoken with a few people on this and they say, well, you have to cut that, that intuition from finite sets breaks down and you can't there's it's something yeah. new no, i think i mean that, that's all so yeah there's a f famous old paradox called galileo's paradox which um where you try to you think of all of the square numbers and you realize well so it's a bit like what we were talking before and you notice that they are a proper subset so there are some numbers which aren't square numbers uh which which so number some natural numbers which aren't square numbers so you think well the square numbers must have less size than the natural numbers mm -hmm. on that argument and then the other way of looking at it, you go but for every natural number, there's a square number. So there must be as many square numbers as there are natural numbers. So actually, they must have the same. They must be at least as big. Mm. Uh, I hope I didn't. There's lots of indication in there which I could have got wrong, but <laughs> it's, it's easy to look up. So what do, we, what do we have here? So we have two principles that work just fine in the finite case, right? So whenever you have a, a, a finite set and you consider a proper subset of a finite set, so you have five ducks and you eat one, then you have four ducks and, and that is a proper subset and that means it has less cardinality that mm -hmm. always works in the finite right. case uh, similarly this idea of saying that we have the same size in mathematics we call this a bijection or this one to map one to one map so which is on two which means it exhausts the other collection so we tie a string from everything in one set to the other set just so that we only have one um, object going to one object and we exhaust the other collection, that means we have a bijection. So that, that's when we say we have the same cardinal. Mm -hmm. That also works perfectly well in the finite case, mm -hmm. but they won't both travel into the infinite case mm -hmm. so well. So the proper subset one uh, is not the one that mathematicians generally use. We tend to say that two collections have the same, two infinite collections have the same size if there is a bijection between them, but we can, we can have proper subsets of an infinite collection, which are have the same cardinality indeed that's the kind of that's the dedekind definition that's a hallmark of an infinite collection you can take an injection of it of the collection into a proper subset of itself in fact bijection into a proper subset of itself so some of the counterintuitive conclusions that follow from that would be something like this infinite cardinality of the infinite set you can so in that um size i guess for lack of a better word you can remove an element and you would still have the same size yep now that, for somebody that thinks in a finitist way, it seems like the concept of removing an element just necessarily implies exactly one less element <laughs> in terms of the size of that set. Well, it, it does imply one less element. It certainly does contain one less element. It's just that that is not what the measure of size that we're using here uh, is, is, is taking into account. Okay. 
So who, so yeah. so if we had the naturals and and let's get to the naturals where we take we we throw out an element. So this is just you know make it palpable. So we throw out the zero, the yeah. zero of the stone, so to speak. <laughs> and well, can we make a bijection between them? Yeah, I just put zero to one, one to two. So it's easy to do this again. So if you're wanting this to live up to the the, the subset notion of, of cardinality, it's, it just won't do. That. So we have a fracture here of some kind. You know, the, the concept is, that that works in the finite case has become broke. You know, is pulled apart. So it, we, yeah. and this is what often happens in a lot of logical kind of studies. So often we'll take a concept into a, a sort of more difficult kind of scenario, and it becomes more subtle. The concept actually these things that were equivalent under very um, normal conditions are no longer equivalent later on. And mm. So you have to kind of make a choice. There are actually people um, who do work on this sort of subset notion of cardinality these days. Uh, so a colleague of mine, um, Leon Horston, has done some work on this. Um, but it's... So people do work... It, it's very difficult to get it to work. So there, there is something very <laughs> elegant about the bijective way of dealing with things, which uh, and also which seems useful. Uh, so people do play, tend to use this one more often. Mm-hmm. So perhaps arguably for pragmatic considerations, pragmatic you know, and simplicity. Yeah. Yes, uh, the, that's a, a consistent answer that I've heard both from logicians and mathematicians is that using this theory of infinities is massively practical. Where when you, if you were to take the finitist approach, the amount of work involved to essentially get the same answer is like, way larger is that is that fair yeah i, I think so. i mean i'm not a, like i don't um work on like a large scale i mean so if you're interested in finite data port analysis where you're doing fluid mechanics and stuff like that those guys would know more about this than me but um yeah my impression is definitely that it's using calculus and tools like this is a, is a, it's, it's efficient mm-hmm. so it seems like the logic of working through the infinite sets and the other sizes of infinite sets works insofar as you accept that base level axiom that there is at least one infinite set. If there is at least one infinite set, well, then you have an infinite number of infinite sets. But that initial step, for me, I know is a hard, is a sticking point. I know for a lot of people is is really a sticking point. And I think it does come down to metaphysics. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you pointed that out, that this, this assumption that when you are dealing with a particular theory, the, the objects and concepts in your theory have to have some meaningful metaphysical existence to them. What would you say to somebody that would claim it is, a, it is reflective of a shortcoming of the orthodox way of doing mathematics that in order to get their theory to work, it requires an acceptance of this initial axiom that has legitimate room mm-hmm. for skepticism about it. If you're skeptical about whether or not there are actual infinities or an infinite set, that's a reasonable position at least. So what would you say to somebody that says, well, that's a problem, that, that it takes, it, you got to get to that first step in order to get to all the other steps? So, I mean, I, I think we come back to, again to this sort of like either a pragmatic or a principled kind of um, defense. And I, I think when you're facing skepticism, you really, I mean, if there is reason for skepticism, it's very rare to, to be able to mount an argument that, that will convince mm. the skeptic otherwise. This isn't to say we shouldn't try. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I, I do think one can provide uh, interesting arguments for the existence of infinity. I thought, I think Dedekind's original one is a fun one. But ultimately, perhaps the best ground to, to, uh, to respond to the skeptic in, in these cases is something more pragmatic. So mm. something along the lines of... Uh, Pointing out that if you do have a finitistic theory, well, as far as we know, there really aren't any. There aren't many that uh, we know to work very well. Mm. Um, so, when you mean work, based on what metric do you mean? You don't. You, you can't do calculus or something like that. Can't do calculus. Yeah, that, that's a. Uh, I mean, we have to be careful. So, finitism is, is is very low down in how things go. We might, you know, we might. So, <laughs> uh, you know, maybe you might say, well, maybe if if I can define a computer which could give you the rule for a particular infinite. So, I mean, where, I mean, it depends where you're on this sort of spectrum. Do you, do you worry about the even numbers? Do you worry when I talk about the even numbers? Because it didn't seem like you did when I was talking about them. So, <laughs> uh, my, own, my own personal intuition is to think um, I'm very wary of even the language of mathematics when we say something like the even numbers. Are we describing a collection of objects or are we defining a concept that we're creating? 
Mm -hmm. So if we're defining a concept, then I would say it doesn't get you to any kind of infinities because as lo you can have as large a collection as you please and it's always going to be finite. If we're talking about a collection of objects like the even numbers, and I, what I mean by mm -hmm. that is as if I were referencing the chairs in this room, then I'm talking about some external platonic object. I'm also very skeptical of that because I, when you, if you posit the existence of the platonic universe, you're positing the existence of a great number of things. <laughs> sure, sure. I'd li yeah. like to have a really restricted yeah. ontology. Of mm -hmm. it. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like I'm not quite getting my. F so I, uh, I'd like to get my finger a little more on what you mean when you when you're talking about the when when, when I talk about the even numbers. What do you? So how are you paraphrasing the? Or it, so one thing <laughs> you could be Toby's talking about Santa Claus now. You know. Uh, so we'll just pass over this and not worry about but but then I could say something that's I could say well you know for numbers divisible by four then it's an even number and that's true so did I say something true or you know so what, what have I done there what what what, what have I in my own yeah, way I suppose, of yeah, so, yeah so here's what I would think because mm -hmm. I'm very partial to this idea of the correlation of our concepts to existent metaphysical entities what I think numbers are are placeholders for concepts. And when we're talking about things like you know, 2 plus 2 equals 4, we're not talking about objects being combined to create a new object. Like if you had the abstract object of 2 and you somehow combined it with the other abstract of 2, you would, abstract object of 2, you would get this new entity of the abstract object of 4. I think what's going on is it's, it's like um, shorthand to describe necessary relations between any things. So we have this amazing ability to abstract. So on, like on this table, there are you know, five items. And what I mean by that is not there are the items in addition to the existence, the number five, which is also here on this table. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a way of talking about, um, it's a way of stripping out um, the units to just talk about the, um, like a quantifier on a, on a unit. Mm -hmm. so, so it's still... Again, just just purely be talking about the way that I conceive of mathematics. Um, you still have a kind of logical certainty in the area of mathematics. I'm not claiming, as some of the intuitionists did, that it's all just kind of made up, like the laws of logic mm -hmm. are just made up. Um, I don't think that's the case. But I'm also not claiming a mathematical Platonism where you re it requires the existence of independent abstract objects out there. I think it's things we come up with in our head that can perfectly correlate to the world. And the cool thing about mm -hmm. numbers is that they are, as we're uh, manipulating them in our minds, they're unitless. So I can talk, like if, if I want to tie my abstractions into the world, I have to say, you know, one cell phone here, one microphone here. I have to have the one X. I have to, mm -hmm. have to tie it to the thing. But when we're just developing the theory of how quantity works, mm -hmm. we can yank the one away from the that underlying unit, which is, yeah, yeah. which is, I mean, this reminds me a bit of some logicism, I suppose. Yes. Yeah, so okay. So yeah. I mean, so like, a, like this abstracting back from reality, and this is what we're kind of left with numbers. Yeah. And I suppose maybe this is like a kind of a metaphysical kind of uh, sort of shoot off or whatever they call it, standoff at this point. Because I think I just have probably have weaker commitments to this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I I'm not too interested, perhaps, in the distinction between concepts and genuine objects. I'm mm -hmm. just interested in what my the, the paraphernalia that my my theory needs me to talk about. And so when I t end up talking about natural numbers, I, I, I posit some rules about how these things work, and I and, and this allows me to then say things like, well, yeah, you know, the, the set of numbers divisible by four is a subset of the even numbers. I can say that, and that, that makes a certain kind of sense. I mean, there, obviously, I can paraphrase this back into something that into without the collections, mm -hmm. perhaps in, in, in some cases, but eventually we'll get to places, and this is why set theory was invented, uh, where it gets harder to do this. So we end up wanting to talk about sets and sets of sets of things, and, and, and this becomes quite a useful thing. So we have to go into dig into kind of analysis if we want to do that. And that mm -hmm. it, it's not trivial. And so this is where Cantor originally came up with these ideas. He's working, I think, with some problems in Fourier series, which uh, I, I haven't done that kind of thing in a long time, so I, I can't speak about it. He, but so the, these did sort of po crop up, though, uh, out of real problems, I mm -hmm. suppose. Yeah, I, but coming back to sort of the question, though, I, I, I feel like the metaphysics, yeah, I feel like, yeah, there's, there's kind of maybe a metaphysical difference here. I think you're maybe being, um, I feel like maybe you're too committed to what a collection should be, and maybe 
maybe mathematicians and set theorists aren't talking about collections in the sense that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Maybe we are talking about what you would think of as concepts. So mm -hmm. maybe this is how you would you should you should translate into your metaphysics what a set theorist is talking about. Mm -hmm. Because, because the, the, mathemat the standard mathematical answer doesn't talk about these sorts of things, right. they don't have to tell you you're wrong. You, know, you can have a debate about this, this yeah. but this is strictly a philosoph philosophy room kind of thing. Yeah. Well, it's interesting when you say that, um, that mathematicians aren't talking about what I'm talking about with collections. But doesn't it go one step deeper is mm -hmm. that they might not be talking about anything. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a possibility. Like, I mean, that, that, that's for all we know. Yeah, it, 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 but, but, but that doesn't... Uh, that doesn't I would, I'm very biased in this, and I would say, well, that's a demonstration of some error in the way that we're conceiving of a theory. If, if we accept this idea that, well, I'm talking about this thing, but it's not a thing, I would say, well, you got, something's got to be revised, because you've got to talk about something. Well, no, we're not saying, we're not, we're not, I'm not saying we're talking about a thing that's not a thing. I'm saying that I'm, I'm leaving a room for some, some fallibility here. For yeah. what a thing is. For yeah, what I mean, it's, well, I mean, here's an example. So, but even on, by my lights, it could turn out that uh, there are no sets as, as I think they are because perhaps the theory that I use, ZFC, is inconsistent, in mm -hmm. which case m my mantra to accept what my theory tells me is, is a bit broken here because my theory tells me everything is true now, so I have to revise it, so I have to use something different. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there are, there are places where, even though there are none, that, that are... So, yeah, what I'm getting is we're leaving open... I'm just being honest about where these sorts of theories are are at, and they, you know, they, they that would be positive evidence that there are no sets if we could show it's inconsistent. But it's very right. very difficult to show these sorts of things by the, there's a certain asymmetry from Gödel that means it's not it, you, showing inconsistency could happen, but and we will never get positive evidence that it is consistent beyond uh, using stronger theories, which are even riskier so to speak but maybe this is a, a bit of a distraction to girdle oh, no, considerations that's, that's that's very much re uh, relevant so as a general philosophic principle you would say that if we're if we're talking about sets we can describe them in a particular way we can describe properties and rules of them and be genuinely metaphysically agnostic on whether or not what we're talking about exists um no i'm no, I, I'm not quite there. What I'm saying is, I'm saying that I'm using this is this is my best theory according, and that I that, so I, I'm running a, this is, again. I'm, I'm now running the mathematician's line, so I'm just being really careful. Uh, so, but yeah, I mean, but this is I, I don't know if I, I I have beliefs that that ontology is much deeper than this. I suppose so. I, I'm very wary of grippy ontolo ontological considerations. I, I I feel like they 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 pull at our intuitions that that probably just don't work in all contexts. Mm. So. When I say that certain things exist, I mean that according to my best theory, which comes from a variety of considerations, mm. my best the, 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 why I chose this is the best theory. My best theory tells me that these things exist, and so I say that they do. Mm. Am I telling you that it, it's impossible for this theory to be wrong? No, I'm not. I'm not going to go that far. I think there are even there are there are possibilities that could show up. I don't think they will. You know, I, I believe this theory in, in the sense I think it's the best theory, but I can't rule them out. Uh, that could show that say the theory is inconsistent. Personally, I'm less um, impressed by metaphysical considerations to try and show me. So, so because so you're, you're arguing that you have a lot of difficulty thinking about infinite collections, and, and I'm going to say, well, okay, maybe. So my move here is to say, maybe, maybe I'm not talking about collections as you as you say. I'm okay. something else. Mm. But but I I think what I'm talking about here makes a certain kind of sense. But uh, and I think it's coherent at the very least, and I think it's pragmatically useful. So you would say that if I were to come along and say, well, infinite sets don't exist, you're going to say that's not really, that, that type of critique is yeah, I'd be Yeah, I'd be surprised if that kind of approach could be persuasive. I feel like... Even if it's correct? Even if you said, okay, well, I grant they don't exist. Oh, no, if I... So can you fill out that question a bit more? So, so if I were to come along and say... Ah, I have some purely metaphysical proof based on the metaphysical, metaphysical status of what numbers are. The numbers are concepts in our head. They do not exist separate of our conception. Mm -hmm. Therefore, all sets must be finite because you can't conceive of all of an infinity. You would say... Yeah, yeah I don't think that would, would sway me much at all. It would probably <laughs> make me think that you're talking about something nearly something different. Else. Something different. We're talking past each other in some kind of way. Yeah. Okay, so last question on, on this. This has been an excellent interview, and I really want to be able to know what you're talking about and what mathematicians are talking about because i've bumped up, up i keep bumping into this wall about conceiving of sets and i think 
there are no are no sets and based mm-hmm. on what I think numbers are, based on what I think a set is. So if we're talking past each other, totally granted, 100% language is ambiguous, so this makes sense. But what are you talking about? Well, I think coming back to, I mean, I, I, we don't have to get too deep into the sets of sets of sets or any of that kind of thing. Coming back to that kind of analogy for Cantor is, 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 is a good place to be. So what I, I think, and a lot of problems in, that we still think about in, in contemporary set theory are based around that kind of area. So thinking about what it would mean to have this infinite sequence of coins going out to the horizon, and then considering all the different possibilities that, that, that there are. So this is the continuum, so this is the reals. And the relationships that we have there are very difficult to kind of sort out. So what I'm considering here is, so the, another way of looking at those heads and tails, these are all, these all represent different, so if I consider, if, if, the end, if the fifth coin is heads and the seventh coin is heads, we'll put that in, in a certain set. Mm. So each of these rows actually represents a different set of natural numbers. So I've, if, you, if you accept this sort of thought experiment, in some sense you're already into the realm of, of, of infinite collections. So it's not that difficult to kind of smuggle them in in some kind of way. Hmm. And what we're interested in here, so maybe where, what set theorists are concerned with is, it's not just even about what rules you could use to, con- to rearrange the coins. We're interested in what really does it mean to have all of the different ways mm-hmm. of arranging the coins. Mm-hmm. And this, this may be a more philosophically satisfying approach to analyzing this is, is modal, but how to get a, a good understanding of what this range of natural, of this range of um, different um, permutations is, is, is a very difficult one. And so this leads us to the problems like the continuum hypothesis, um, where we, so we can, it's very easy to explain. So we know what Cantor's theorem is. We know that the reals are larger than the naturals. The continuum hypothesis says that there's no size in between. And you might think, well, I mean, in some sense, this is the first and easiest and most obvious question to ask at this point. Uh, we now know, after it took it about 70 years for people to discover that uh, no, we, uh, that ZFC uh, or, or ordinary theory couldn't act- can't actually figure out whether or not that's true. And at this point uh, uh, now, we still have no sort of palpable answer or real or beyond sort of pragmatic ways of trying to approach this sort of problem. It's, mm-hmm. So... Even at its beginnings, we once you even invite an infinity into the door, in, into your house, so to speak, uh, it, it, it ruins it, everything. It, ru- <laughs> uh, it, it, it makes things very challenging. Yeah, yeah. Does it ruin everything? It blows everything up. Maybe it doesn't ruin it, but it, all of the standard intuition and all the the way that we think about everything in our lives, really, it just says. You know, I'm been, none of this applies. Well, no, I don't think it says none of it applies. I think it says some of it applies and some of it doesn't. And you have to kind of keep, <laughs> okay. be very careful. Um, what if it? What? What is the? When I think of all the, you know, when I think of addition, subtraction, multiplication, mm-hmm. sets, uh, I think of all the standard rules of arithmetic and how they correlate with infinity. I think of the nature of numbers and how they would correlate with them. None of those seem to carry over. But parts of them do. Okay. I mean, so yeah. I mean, you can't. Maybe none think is too strong. Uh, I mean, so the, the point is that as you move into infinite cases, but I mean, it, this happens in other areas of mathematics too. Just so, just because addition won't work in the same way in various <laughs> areas of algebra as, as it will Fair in enough, the natural yeah. numbers. So, similarly, moving into this space of the of, of infinite objects, they don't work exactly the same. Like, so some some laws that you you hold really close and dearly to your heart, they just don't work there in that kind of space anymore. But still, we can see something common about, and there's a reason why we still think of it as being addition. We can actually show that you know that, that, that they instantiate the same kind of pattern. If, so, if you moved into sort of a mm-hmm. more category theoretic approach, mm-hmm. so you can still see that it is addition of a kind, but it just doesn't behave the same way. Mm. Okay. Okay, I know I said one more question, but I got to sneak one more question in here because when you said that, it just came up in my head. So when I asked, you know, what is it that you're talking about? And for me, right, the way that I'm conceiving of numbers is it's this abstraction from the existent things. So the number, the numbers are these abstractions. But when you're, and the, the example you gave was the coin, the mm-hmm. possibility of the coin. In terms of, in terms of metaphysics, that infinite quantity or descriptor, is it tied to existing things or are we saying that it's not tied to actually existing things because there's no actually there's no actually existing thing? So it's no longer, the way that we conceive of numbers is no longer abstracting from the concrete, it's necessarily something that's outside the concrete, right? So if, if, I, if I think of a, I guess the, the analogy where like I have this concept of mm-hmm. colors and I come up with the concept of colors because of experience of color, the mm-hmm. concrete Thing. And so I have now I have abstracted from 
red and blue and green, I'm thinking, okay, I got the concept of color. But if you do that with numbers, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, it doesn't get you to that infinity because it's always about abstracting from the concrete. So then what is it, well, what are you talking about when you're talking about the, the, that infinite quantity that doesn't seem to be experienced or anything like that? Just a real softball. Yeah, no, no, I was trying to think about how, how, how one approach. I mean, yeah, I suppose so I'm tempted to try to go back to you know, something like, let's go back to ancient Greece and think of Zeno and think about like this, the, the kind of... So yeah. let, let's forget, the, uh, so Achilles is racing the tortoise, but just mm-hmm. forget the tortoise and just recall that Achilles runs half a mile, he runs right. a quarter of a mile, he runs an eighth of a mile, he runs a sixteenth, et cetera, et cetera. And we know this thing converges at, uh, you know, at one mile. So, you yeah. know, he, like, so, but we, th- this seems like a very palpable way to think of a process in the world that, that has infinitely many parts. I know this doesn't like, line up with, with physics, but that's not, that, physics doesn't line up with our intuitions either. This is a very intuitive kind of, of description of a, of a process. That, that, uh, so I'm not saying you can complete it, but you can get the idea of completing it really easily. So you can you can see what it means to. Yeah, but I can't. I think Zeno was right. I think his. I, I think. I yeah. think the resolution to Zeno's paradox is that space time is finite. It has to be discrete because otherwise you couldn't have motion. Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm. Um, <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't share that one with you. But that. Um, what's another way of trying to look at it then? Um, this may or may not work. So, but I want to try and convince you that there's some use in, in talking about sort of infinite processes and that, that we indeed actually pop up into the transfinite relatively easily. Um, so you'd agree that 2 equals 2, All right? Okay. Yep. And it's true that 2 equals 2. Okay. And it's true that it's true that 2 equals 2. Mm-hmm. And it's true that it's true that it's true that 2... And this starts to get very tedious. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that, that, that's sort of implicitly sort of surfacing here is that you think, probably think, well, why is this tedious? Because it's true that no matter how many times I say it's true that in front of 2 equals 2, that will still be true. Mm-hmm. What I've done there, though, is I've, I've talked about infinitely many... It, so my statement there is talking about the poss- every different possibility of adding finitely many it's true that's in front of 2 equals 2. And then I'm saying at the end of it, I want to hold that whole thing in one statement. I'm saying that thing's true. So in some sense, I've, I've, I'm covering... So what I, this is another way of thinking about Dedekind's thinking about thinking about um, sort of way of his thought experiment for infinity. This is, so this is a way of doing it with truth. And so I'm trying to say that actually, yeah, there is a reason to, to want, I, I want to be able to say that thing now. I want to be able to say that it's true, that no matter how many times you put truth in front of something, it's still, that thing remains true. And to do that, my theory is somehow infinitely sort of extended. There are, I've iterated infinitely many times. But not actually infinite. Well, I'm yeah. talking about the. So if, if, if that if that last statement is true, then there can be no limit to. So what I'm saying is. Yeah, but at any given time, mm-hmm. as if you say it's true that it's true that it's true that it's true. Yeah. It doesn't matter how many you have. That's that is true. Yeah. Uh, but however many you have, it's still going to be a finite amount. You can't ever. It doesn't. I would say it can't even be conceived to say actually stretching infinitely. So I I might even yeah. I could even use the term infinite, but I wouldn't mean it in an, in take the example where it has an actually infinite amount of it is true that it is true that it is true. And then I, I, no, that doesn't, that can't occur. Right. That can't occur. The actual. You can't, so yeah, I agree. There is, all I can think of is, there's, there's the first one, it's true that zero equals zero, it's true that it's true that zero, so there's, mm-hmm. there's sort of, it, 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 it goes off, I, I claim, to infinity, but there is no adding infinitely many in front. So the thing that approximates this, so this is me saying, it's true that everything along that sequence is true. When I do that, I've captured, I've, I'm talking about infinitely many statements. So, this is, so another way of thinking about this is Dedekind's way. So, you know, I have a thought, I think about this thought, I think about thinking about this thought, mm-hmm. and then I can think about thinking about it as many times as I want. Yes, but that's still, that's still a discrete amount. You can think about it as many times as you want, still doesn't get you to that completed. <laughs> no, it, uh, so yeah, the, the, there's no debate I, the, okay. that you can complete this, right? So the, the, in, this, in, in, the, in the palpable sense of, like, so in the, the strong sense of complete, where you can, you can get the, to the end of it. No, I, the, I'm... What, what about with Zeno, though? Wouldn't, isn't that the claim that you actually can complete the infinite process? Because Achilles actually reaches that end point? Yeah, but each of these processes takes... So this is the standard line, right? So it takes okay. less and less time. So we, can, you know, we know the sequence of times converges. That's, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously we, we have a, a deep disagreement here, which might yes. be worth exploring, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't think uh, we'll have time on this 
interview, but I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate your patience, by the way. I know uh, this has been, uh, when, you're get, when you get into really standard orthodox ideas, I think people often get frustrated when they they, they come base level skepticism and trying to pursue it. So I really appreciate you taking the time to talk. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. All right. That was my interview with Dr. Toby Meadows. Hope you guys enjoyed it. As always, I did. And I must say, I'm still not there. I still would be considered a finitist. I've had several of these conversations with people who really know what they're talking about. And I'm just not persuaded. I don't think you can complete an infinity. I don't think there is an infinite number of sizes of infinite sets. I think a huge amount of revision needs to be done if we're going to base mathematics on sound foundations. As always, lots more to say, and I got a fun episode for you coming up next week. Make sure to tune in and have a great week.